I want to start by um, telling you guys a few things about us. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of history um, and uh, why, we, why we make what we make. Um, and then we'll do some tasting. I think uh, what Bruce suggested with a large group like this, I think what we'll do is take it in shifts. So I'm going to be up here. I'll do uh, 10 minutes or so of talking. Um, and then I'll stand up here and I'll pour you samples of the three products that I brought tonight. So I got my 80 proof rye, which is our most popular spirit nationwide. Um, our 92 proof, which is our distiller's edition. I'll tell you what makes that different. Um, and then our cast proof, which in my opinion is the best that we make. It's a really, really nice spirit. Uh, double gold winner from the San Francisco uh, World Spirits Competition. So really, really good stuff. Um, the uh, distillery, we are Catoctin Creek. That's how you say it, Catoctin Creek. Um, it's an Indian name. It's the uh, Algonquian tribe. So these are some of the peoples, the Powhatans, who met with Jamestown settlers when they came into Virginia. Um, the, the name Catoctin is the name of the actual creek that we sit on. And it is um, a, uh, it means the land of many deer. So there are a lot of white-tailed deer in Virginia. Um, I try not to hit them with my car. Sometimes I, I don't succeed in that. Um, the uh, tons and tons of white-tailed deer. So we're basically in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. So if you're thinking of like sort of a sense of place, you know, uh, the Appalachian Trail, the Potomac River, the Shenandoah River, the Shenandoah Valley, that's all within about two minutes of our distillery. So real, real pretty area. And, and yet we're about an hour from DC. And so that means um, DC people have a lot of reasons to drink. And so <laughs> we built our business on feeding those people alcohol. Um, so to tell you a little bit about history about the distillery of why we started, I'll tell you further history about um, sort of drinking in Virginia. So um, Virginia is one of the birthplaces of American whiskey. So in the pre-colonial days, um, Americans were all Brits, right? Um, and uh, we were drinking rum. So uh, the Brits were bringing sugar from the islands, they were bringing rum from the islands, and um, we were distilling uh, rum in America uh, for all these kinds of things. So if you were to go over to some highfalutin party and have some punch, it was rum in the punch bowl. Um, if you were doing medicine or your wife was making tinctures and things like that, it was rum they were using. If you were cleaning a wound, it was rum they were using. So rum was ubiquitous. And then we have the Revolutionary War and the Brits got kind of pissed off with us for having a war with them, um, so they cut off the supply of sugar. So all of a sudden, we have a crisis, right? We have no rum, no sugar. Um, what are we going to do? Well, in colonies, in the colonies, what we had was lots and lots of land and lots of people with Scots-Irish immigration, Scots-Irish descent. Well, a Scots-Irishman knows what to do with lots of land. Um, the, the grain that grew best in the mid-Atlantic area, so here I'm talking about Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, on up into even Quebec, was rye. So it wasn't really corn back then at, at the time. And so they had all that rye, um, and they knew that if they would distill that rye, they could preserve it, they wouldn't have to worry about mice and mold, things like that. And so rye whiskey, rye whiskey really took off after the Revolutionary War. Um, at the time of the war, uh, those of you that are familiar with Mount Vernon, maybe some of you have been there. Um, George Washington, at his estate, was the largest commercial distiller of whiskey in America during his lifetime. And, uh, and he was making rye whiskey. So rye whiskey had a big part in Virginia's history, and almost everybody forgot about it after Prohibition. So, um, you know, in the 70s and the 80s, you could find a little bit of rye in the 90s. Um, but most of the people, if you said rye, they were saying Canadian, right? Canadian and rye became synonymous. So say, give me a rye, and they'd hand you some kind of Canadian whiskey. Um, uh, of course, y'all here in Kentucky have always been making rye and putting some of it in your bourbon. But, uh, but uh, a rye as a standalone pro product was pretty much wiped out and gone as an American product when we started the company. So we wanted to tell this story. In 2009, when we started this company, we wanted to tell the story of rye whiskey. We really liked the flavor, we loved the historical context that it had to our sense of place and where we, we live. And so Becky and I started making rye. Now Becky is my wife. Um, we are a married couple still. And um, we, uh, we decided, so um, basically we were both engineers. I was a software engineer. I worked for 20 years as a government contractor, which is why I have a great love of whiskey. And um, <laughs> Becky was a chemical engineer. And so the, the, the genesis story for us in this company is that I was sitting in an office. I was working on a Navy program. We used to put computer gear on Navy airplanes. And um, sitting in, a Navy, or in an office and doing an awful lot of PowerPoint charts and thinking, you know, um, as I was approaching 40, 
I was thinking, you know, if I was going to construct for myself a perfect version of hell, it would be sitting in a windowless office under a fluorescent light, making PowerPoint charts for people who never read them. <laughs> so I started to daydream about making something. And uh, um, I kept going back to when I was a 15-year-old kid and I worked in a winery. And I was like, you know, it's cool. In a winery, you press the grapes, you bottle it, you ferment it, you do all this stuff, and at the end of the day, or at the end of a, a fermentation period, you have something in your hand. You can present it to somebody and pour it and taste it and say, I made that. And that was kind of drawing me back to doing something worthwhile, something, you know, from hand, by hand. And so, um, at the time, Virginia, in our county, had 50 wineries. And so I was like, well, you can't throw a rock without hitting a winery, so I don't want to start a winery. Um, and uh, so what about a distillery? Nobody's done that. That should be cool. Little did I know how difficult it is at the time. I had no, not, no idea. So I took it to my wife. Now Becky is um, a chemical engineer. So her background was in manufacturing. So she would make things like contact lenses and computer parts and things like that. And her job was basically taking things from research and development into mass production. I was like, well, I got something for you to mass produce. You'd be a great distiller. And surprisingly, um, she, uh, she basically said, look, I'm a chemical engineer. Distillation is not difficult science. It's, it's pretty easy. I can learn what I need to learn. Um, I can make your whiskey. And I was like, yay. Um, and she says, but you got to make sure that we can make money making whiskey. You need to write a business plan. And so I was like, damn. She always does that to me. So, so I went back and I, I started writing this business plan. Now, in, this is 2008, so we're talking time, timing-wise. Lehman Brothers, too big to fail, all that stuff is happening. And me, like every one of y'all probably at the time, has some of these retirement accounts and you're seeing all this money going down and you're thinking, where's the bottom gonna hit, right? So the, the mindset for us at the time was we have a, a little nest egg that we'd saved up for the past 20 years as engineers we better sure as hell do something with it before it's gone. So our, my whole business plan was basically, let's take all this money we saved from 20 years of working and let's put it in copper, as I like to say. Um, we got a bunch of copper equipment and let's start this business. So I wrote this business plan and I presented it to Becky basically because, you know, by emptying our savings, she was my first investor. And, um, and I took it to her and uh, we said, uh, uh, showed it to her and she's like, you know, I mean, it looks kind of, it looks doable. It looks like something we could do. So she said, being smart, um, why don't you take it to the bank and see if you can get some funding, some, some business financing. And knowing that, of course, it's 2008, the bank is going to say, no way, go on. And, uh, and she will have been the loving, supportive wife. And all right, hon, well, you tried. Go back to work now and get on with our lives. Because we got boys in school and, you know, all of this stuff. So um, we took it to the bank. and. About two weeks later, the bank called back and said that we had been approved. They're like, holy crap, what? <laughs> so we, had, we had a half million dollars of bank financing in the darkest economic period in my lifetime. Um, and, uh, and both of us were like, well, crap, I think we have to do it now. Um, and so we started uh, to get the licensing and we started to get the equipment and put this business together in reality instead of just on paper. And uh, within about um, six months, we had the first legal distillery making alcohol in Loudoun County since before 1930. So uh, it was a pretty exciting time. Uh, the Virginia ABC, which is our state-run liquor system, um, true socialism, if you ever want to talk about socialism, the Virginia ABC, they buy and sell all the alcohol across the whole state. Um, they were our first customer. And I will say one thing about socialism, they do pay on time, so that's nice. Um, <laughs> they basically put us on the shelves, and then we quickly got into Maryland, and DC, and New York. Um, that was in our first year. And today, now 10 years later, we uh, have liquor in 26 states, including the great bourbon state of Kentucky. I take that as a small victory just to even be in this state. Um, and we're selling internationally in uh, places like Holland and the UK and Germany and Italy. Uh, Singapore is another, another country we sell in. So we're selling a little bit of whiskey in a lot of places and we're really happy to do it. Um, the whiskey that we make, Catoctin Creek Rye, we make rye and we make only rye. So we're never going to make bourbon. Um, what we want to do is tell that story of Virginia history, that Virginia rye. Um, the rye is made uh, in a Virginia style and people don't really know what that is because we're still telling them. But basically what that means is we're starting with Virginia grain, so we source it from four different farms. 
Now it's 100% rye, so nothing in that bottle but rye. There's no barley, there's no corn, there's no wheat. Um, but the rye comes from four different places. And so if you think about something in terms of like a terroir, like they'll say in wine, these different regions have different flavors. So some of the northernmost rye that we have um, has a really sweet flavor, but not much depth to it. And then the other tastes more spicy. Some of it tastes a little more grassy. And by putting those together in a mash bill, Becky's able to make a complex sort of uh, flavor that is more than just a one-dimensional flavor of a single grain product and, yet, and still have 100% rye. So it's a really interesting thing. But the second step, of course, is the distillation. So we ferment it all ourselves, we mash it all ourselves, and then we distill it. And the distillation is in very small batches, 300 gallons at a time, in a copper pot still. Okay, so that's, that's a big difference too. A lot of column still whiskey out there, which is sort of fine-tuned to have one sort of flavor. But in our case, Becky is extracting all of that from the pot still. And I heard a really good analogy, I think it was Max Wattman, sorry, um, who said that the difference between a column still and a pot still is if you look at a column still, you think about distillation like a prism. So a prism takes light and it spreads it out into all these different colors. And a column still, you can come in and say, look, I like this color here, green, and I'm going to pull that out, and that's the flavor we're going to use. But in a pot still, all those colors come through, and then by taste, you can pick out, I'll take a little red, I'll take a little white, a little, or a little orange, a little yellow, a little green, a little blue, and you can build a flavor across that spectrum. And that's what we do here. So when Becky is distilling this, it's a nine hour distillation. It's coming out at a slow trickle, and she's tasting every single day, every single batch, every five minutes. She walks over, tastes the spirit, and um, adjusts the system to pull off the best flavors from that. So during the hearts of that run, that's what's coming off is all of that beautiful rye whiskey. She's pulling it off, and then at the end of the run, what we would then call the tails, um, is, is redistilled. We take that out and we redistill that, and that's actually the base spirit that we use to make our gin. So I have everything that we use finds some kind of use. There's no waste in our process. Um, all the spent mash goes to local Amish, uh, not Amish, I'm sorry, Quaker farms in the area that have, one of our Quaker farms has been farming on the same land, same family since 1750. So that's really special, and we give that mash to them for free. Um, Sarah, who's the farmer, she then gives me a, a freezer full of beef every year, and that is a okay swap for me. I am not a vegetarian. I will take beef for whiskey anytime. Um, so that's a little bit about the product, a little bit about the history. I will mention we're going to taste the three spirits here tonight, so you'll come over at, at your leisure and I'll walk you through it. Tell us about the aging of your product. You bet. So our product is aged between two and four years, so you know, relatively young for craft whiskey. Um, but we use a 30 gallon Minnesota white oak barrel. And so we felt that the 30 gallon barrel had a couple advantages. It was small enough that we got a little bit faster wood extraction time, but long enough that we still have the oxidization that's required to get that deeper, richer flavor. Um, the, the practical reason we chose the 30 gallon barrel was when we first started, Becky was the one and only employee and a 30 gallon barrel was the biggest barrel she could lift up by herself. <laughs> so, so she could roll it, she could tip it on a pallet. Um, and so it's kind of become standard for our business now to use a 30 gallon barrel. We have a product that's coming out in February to celebrate our 10th anniversary called Rabble Rouser, and that one's done in a full size 53 gallon barrel. Um, that's our uh, four year old bottled and bond whiskey that's coming out in February. Um, and uh, it's done in the larger barrel, but this Roundstone Rye product, we really like that, the flavor of that in that 30 gallon barrel. Um, we age it in a, um, not a rick house, but basically palletized in an un-air-conditioned um, warehouse. So we are subject to the heat of summer and the cold of winter, and just like Kentucky, I mean, the climate is almost the same. 100 degrees in the summertime and below zero in the wintertime, and crazy springs where it goes back and forth every day. And the, the, the weather really drives that whiskey out of that wood. So we're really pleased with how that develops. It's a, we don't need to, we don't need to rotate them. Um, so the, the whiskey in that barrel, you know, when we pull it down, and dump it into the tanks for bottling. Um, you know, it gets all mixed and homogenized. I would note every one of our bottles of whiskey, whether it's the 80 proof or the cask proof, is a single barrel whiskey. So that's everything we do is single barrel, and not any bit of filtering to any of it. So no chill filtering at all. The only filtering we do on this whiskey is a piece of linen to catch the barrel char. So it's as close to God intended um, as we can get it. Are you you use a heavy char, or light char? It's medium char, right in the middle. So on a scale of one to five to three. Mm. You just use barrels one time? Like just one time. So just like bourbon and just like every other whiskey in America, we can only use it once. Um, with the uh,
cast proof, occasionally we'll do some finishing. So we've done finishing in wine barrels, brandy barrels. Um, we've done some finishing in maple casks and things like that. But um, the main line is just in that in that one-time uh, Minnesota white oak cask. And the other question I had, I know usually they talk about having malted barley in mm -hmm. with, the, with the mash. Well, how does that work with your? So with a hundred percent rye, that's a good question. That's a um, so with 100% rye, usually they'll do it like a 95% rye, like you'll see that with bullet. Mm -hmm. um, and 5% of it is barley, so you get the enzymes that they need for um, sacrification. So particularly it's alpha amylase and glucoamylase, which break down the starch into sugar for fermentation. Um, in our case, we just add those enzymes. So basically, that's a method that is pretty common these days. Um, you can buy those enzymes basically from an uh, enzyme maker and then, and then we add. It's, it's a really cool process. The enzymes act like a biological catalyst. So they, it's like, if you know what a catalyst is, it's a, it's a thing that happens in a reaction but doesn't become part of the reaction. And you can see it, like we only use like for a 300 gallon mash ton, it's like basically one of these punch cups of enzyme. And you can actually see a shockwave as it liquefies the starch. The, the stuff will look like peanut butter, and then you pour the enzyme in, and it goes, and then a big tornado vortex opens up because it becomes liquefied. Um, it's pretty cool. I like seeing that. Sweet mash. Sweet mash. Yeah, everyone's fresh every time. <laughs>